This is Data Podcast. In the ever-changing world of data, this is the podcast packed full of information to keep you right on top of all the developments. From AWS and Azure, through to data science, big data, AI and NoSQL, and everything in between, we cover the essential updates from both a technical and non-technical perspective, including special guests and in-depth interviews. Now, please welcome your hosts, Rajiv Baha and Shabnam Khan, with today's episode of Data Podcast. Our guest today is Frank Levine. Frank Levine leads the data and analytics practices at Wintelec and co-hosts the Data Driven Podcast. He blogs regularly at frankworld.com and you can watch him on his YouTube channel, Frank's World TV at franksworld.tv. This is Shabnam and I'm co-hosting with Rajiv today. Welcome to our show, Frank. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. So we are so glad to have you in our show. Uh, Rajiv, take it away. All right. Thank you, Shabnam. So I know you've gone through some uh, really exciting certification uh, project. Actually, you've done gone through Microsoft's professional certification for data scientists. And also you're training others in this area. What are the four units of this data science certification program? And where does the units of modules also overlap with Microsoft, another certification around like big data? Right. So I found myself about a year ago, kind of, uh, I was uh, laid off from Microsoft and, and pondering what my next career move would be. And I knew I wanted to get into data science, but I didn't really know where to start. So I, I investigated a number of programs. And um, at this time, I think the Microsoft program had been out um, for a month or two. And, um, you know, given the cost to get the official certification versus the um, the cost to do this at a university or some other means, uh, it really was, uh, particularly for someone who was laid off, <laughs> uh, cost, cost was a bigger factor than normal. And um, I decided that, um, you know, at the time it was $49 a class. I think now it's uh, $99 a class. Um, so I decided to pursue that um, and then kind of see, see where the wind took me from there. Uh, and, um, so the, the program is um, um, uh, basically nine classes and one final capstone project um it's broken up into several modules uh, you know one is kind of introducing data science uh, which kind of covers you know how do you how do you query relational data um uh, to how do you analyze and visualize data uh then there's kind of a middle part where they talk about understanding statistics uh, and core data science concepts um and then kind of the final one is you know what's this what is machine learning? How do you understand it? Uh, and at that point, you can start doing um, a couple of different uh, electives. You know, what what exactly did you want to um, pursue in that? And uh, I, I had chose to basically applied machine learning. Uh, in other words, like how would you use machine learning in real world problems? There was also one, uh, you know, integrating um, Cortana with your experience and and things like that. And um, I also, you also have a choice of language to pursue. As, as you know, um, there's the, the, the two languages of data science right now are R and Python. Um, I originally was going to go with R, but I decided that um, I would go with Python. Um, and I made this decision, you know, last year. So I was like, well, if this data science thing doesn't work out, there's plenty of other uses for Python. Mm-hmm. That's um, right. IoT or whatnot. And, you know, as I dove into the syntax and stuff, I think, as someone who comes from a Java, C Sharp, Perl background uh, in my career, um, Python kind of made more sense to me. R is kind of a different mental philosophy in terms of a language. Oh, that's great. And in fact, when you mentioned that you were laid off from Microsoft about a year ago, I recently made an acquaintance. I heard that he also uh, got laid off from Microsoft recently. And if if he hadn't gotten laid off, then he would have been in Las Vegas in Microsoft Reignite 2017. So, <laughs> you know, with all the news that, that is happening around the Las Vegas oh, that's right. yeah. mass shooting. So I was like, oh, in a way, that's kind of a bit of a <laughs> silver lining. It's one of those things where I look back on it now mm-hmm. and I, it was always my dream to work in Microsoft. I, you know, yeah. and, uh, my time there, I spent five and a half years there, mm-hmm. which is, um, you know, a full nearly two years longer than I spent at any other employer. 
Yep. Um, and I would have stayed if they would have me. I would have stayed another ten. Nice. Uh, but um, you know, it, getting laid off, kind of looking back, was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was kind of, I was in a, it was in a very, I was in a very unique kind of role, and my skill sets were really dependent on Windows client application development, Windows Phone development, mm-hmm. uh, Windows 10 UWP development, um, which are fun technologies, but you know, realistically, the marketability of those technologies is, shall we say, subpar. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I found myself kind of looking for work with just those core skill sets, I, I realized that, you know, the only place my skills were marketable were in Microsoft. And um, I, I just decided that, you know, that is a big risk. I mean, to put kind of your eggs in all one basket. And, you know, I really had the chance to, it's going to sound really corny, but I'll say it anyway. I mean, use the, uh, use what happened as an opportunity to make myself a better person. Yeah, that's the best way to go about it. Thank right. you. That's awesome. Uh, so I know that you have just touched um, a little more, um, a little bit on Cortana intelligence on your certification course. Can you tell us a little bit on that, uh, specifically what sort of commitment and technical knowledge is required for that Capstone project in data science certification? So what's interesting about the Capstone project is, um, so one of the one of the background challenges to this was convincing my wife that no, who is a very patient, wonderful woman, uh, would <laughs> would be to convince her that I needed to take time off to completely go from being a client application developer into data science. I needed to, you know, stop what I was doing and retool, um, and really retool, relearn, and um, just focus solely on this. And um, she was very patient, but I didn't want to overextend that. So I, I worked really hard. Um, I finished everything start to finish in about six and a half months. And uh, I would have done it in four and a half months uh, if the capstone project was offered every month. Uh, it's only offered every quarter. And um, so that was a little that was a little stressful. <laughs> uh, but there's a silver lining there too that I'll get to. But um, the capstone project. Uh, so first off, um, I was the first class that went through the new style of capstone projects that they do. They do it in conjunction with the third party. Um, and um, as opposed to before, they kind of ran it solely through edX. Now they, they, there was a, basically an open data science challenge website uh, where, they, uh, where they, they pull in the problem space. And um, I, was, I was ready. You know, I, 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 I felt like a boxer or you know, somebody in the UF, uh, UFC space where I was training, I mean, hardcore, day and night. Uh, learning this stuff, I was ready for like, you know, a full on, you know, marathon, 10 rounds of just pure data science, like, you know, battling. Um, so I, uh, I, I connected with um, a gentleman named Kent Bradshaw, who was also going through the program, and um, Andy Leonard, who who's, has been a guest on your show previously. Um, I uh, was a mutual friend and he said, you know, Kent's going through this program too. I think he's looking for a, a partner to work on the capstone project. And I said, oh, that's great. So am I. And um, <laughs> so we ended up going through it. And I mean, I'm not sure in the whole capstone project, while it, there was a challenge and you, you really did apply everything you learned throughout the entire prob- uh, problem, I think I made it so big in my mind that when I finally got to the project, it was almost anticlimactic mm-hmm. when I was like, you know, I was going through this and, and I was like, um, I think in, in this, you have a four weeks to do it. And I think I did it in about like 14 days. So I was like, you know, when I submitted my first model to, to go for it, I, I kind of, the problem space was basically um, determining um, student loan repayment. Uh, rates for various um, students and universities, and um, it was basically configuring that. And there was a uh, there was a number of things that they had said that you know you had you have a root you had to have a root mean squared error of um, you know that really determined your grade. So if you had a root mean square error value of twelve and up, you know you didn't pass. As, as you got lower, you got a higher grade. So I was just completely shocked when kind of glowing through my notes, and I took. I took, I feverishly took notes for like six months. So I had a whole stack of legal pads. <laughs> and um, so I was going through and, 
And, you know, some of the problems seemed like problems that we had faced in our other classes and earlier final exams. And um, make a long story short, although it's probably too late at this point, um, it was a lot like uh, one of the earlier classes. So I applied to say methodology and um, and algorithms. And first shot, I got basically a, a root mean squared error of of seven and a half, which is was enough to basically get 100 percent on the on the final. That's awesome. Nice. So it's, it's I was so excited. I, you know, because <laughs> you had that moment and while well, the thing kind of processes the value and I was just like sweating and like holding my breath. And, <laughs> and then when it, when it came back 100, I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I had wow. refreshed the page. And um, so it almost felt anticlimactic at that point. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was super excited, as they say at Microsoft. And, uh, and then after that, I had to submit the final paperwork and then that's peer reviewed. And um, so it was uh, when it was over, it was like, wow, this is great. I, I, I I've done it, you know, uh, um, it was a it was a, a tremendous sense of accomplishment. That's so cool. I may have to borrow or steal your notes sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Somebody said I should turn them into a book. Maybe I will. Yeah, that's a good idea. And let us know if you need it. Need some sort of book review done. <laughs> yeah, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> cool, cool. I'm sure you you probably have seen this uh, scenario as you're learning about data science or going through that certification from time to time. Somebody says, ooh, coffee is unhealthy based on a study, or somebody else is uh, mentioning some other counter study. No, it's totally healthy. You could literally live off of it problem free. So the question is, does statistics or overfitting in data model play any role in, in this kind of you know confusing studies or counter studies? Oh, absolutely. And I think it was Mark Twain who said there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> and um, so I mean, statistics can be Statistics in and of itself is a field of study devoted towards, I guess, understanding the nature of numbers. Can those numbers be selectively revealed to come to the conclusion that you want to? Absolutely. So I heard a joke the other day, uh, and it was a it was a statistician went duck hunting, and um, he shot up too high the first time, and then the second time he shot down too low, and he says, "I got one." <laughs> So I guess with the thinking that, you know, the average in there, yes, he got a duck, probably. Um, and I think absolutely. In fact, when I when I took the stats uh, class, you know, when, when you're making a career shift at any age um, or when you're further along in your career, it, it, it's difficult. I mean, you have to you have to unlearn some of the things you've learned. You have to be uh, comfortable with uncertainty and not knowing, you know, not being the top dog anymore. And um, that's a, that's a hard thing to do. And so I really wasn't sure that this would be a successful transition until I took the stats class and got through the stats class. Mm -hmm. Because it was that point that I understood kind of the, the magic formula, if you will, of data science and AI. Um, and that, you know, because from the outside looking in, this data science thing, this machine learning, I mean, it looks like magic. Uh, and to quote another great author, uh, you know, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And 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 understanding statistics really kind of took away the magic. It made a lot of sense now, you know, why this type of algorithm running a, 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 reg, a regression, why that works. And that, that really helped. And it was actually that class, which I think some, took some time in late February, early March. That was when I said, I'm a data scientist. Like it was, it was that was the that was the highest hill to climb. I That's won't funny. lie, that class was hard, yeah. but um, that was the that was the highest mountain to climb. And, and everything after that had been kind of it fell much more into place. When you're doing your STEM studies, let's say computer science or any other uh, technical field during your undergrad years, were there any moments you were like, "What am I gonna do with statistics or algebra or calculus? Yeah, I'm never gonna use it at work." <laughs> oh, that yeah, I have, I thought, I, it's funny i have to be very careful how i say this because mm -hmm. uh, my son is in second grade and okay. he okay. apparently loves math he okay. loves math that's awesome <laughs> and uh he asked me once uh you know last year like did you did you like math as a kid and i, I my, my first reaction was oh no and i was like <laughs> uh oh what did i just say <laughs> um you know fortunately my wife uh who who did get an undergrad degree in math um, she loved math and she was able to distract him 
Well, I kind of backpedaled <laughs> on that. Good rescue. Uh, yeah, it was a good rescue. Uh, we make a good team. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I think the way math is taught um, from middle school on in, in the U.S. is, is, is atrocious. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not blaming other people for my dislike of math. But I will say, as I've gotten older, I've really appreciated the classes that I took in university and beforehand that I thought were garbage at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I guess you could say I was that stereotypical coder. I just wanted to I just want to start sling code. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, 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 I enjoy learning the theory about computer science and uh, but I really just wanted to start slinging code and solving problems. And um, uh, I guess that's the impatience of youth. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I've gotten older, I, I've really come to appreciate that. Um, uh, kind of wishing now that I'd taken more math classes, but I, at the time I wouldn't have appreciated it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can relate to that feeling. <laughs> I know I'm not alone in my <laughs> in my <laughs> dislike sure. of math, and mm -hmm. um, I might be rare, if not alone, in my recent uh, rediscovery of math. <laughs> there mm -hmm. you go. <laughs> Alrighty. So another cool thing you do is co-hosting the Data Driven Podcast with Andy Leonard. He was also our guest in the past. In your Facebook page for Data Driven Podcast, your listeners also get to become your viewers and see live videos from data science, SQL Server, and other technology-related conferences. What are some of the insights from recent big conferences? I think what's really interesting in the answer to that is the classical um, consultant uh, answer is it depends. So I would say <laughs> what we're seeing, and you see it, what you see at these different conferences is the, 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 the approaching storm of AI and ML uh, in all these fields. So a lot of data science uh, events right now that have been around for a year or two, they're very heavily focused on academic people, academic audiences. So there was one in um, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, that I attended. Uh, it was hosted by Capital One. And, you know, I was in the speaker's room and, you know, it was very clear who the academics were versus who the engineers were. Uh, <laughs> one gentleman from the University of Maryland, I mean, he, he, he fit the... If you think of a, a typical university professor, he had it. He had a little tweed suit on, very proper accent. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, and, and I think he meant it as a compliment, <laughs> was that he's so excited now that these conferences now include practitioners like you. Mm. <laughs> I that, that was interesting. That um, was, really was. I mean, that kind of depends, right? <laughs> it all depends. Yeah, I know. It could be like, well, you know, how did he mean that? Did he mean like, you know, he really is excited that we have practitioners, <laughs> like practitioners in a good way or like, you know, oh, the help is here, you know? <laughs> yeah, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how he meant that, but I'm going to take it on the positive way. But I mean, I, I and, and you see that in, in, in the SQL Server and, and other technology events. There's, um, if you go to a SQL Saturdays or, or, or a SQL event, there's mm -hmm. a lot of people who have traditionally been kind of DBAs or data engineers, and they're wondering how is this machine learning thing and AI and, and the rise of kind of smarter BI systems, how is that going to affect their career? How is that going to affect their day-to-day -day jobs? And there's a lot of DBAs out there who are uh, in a position uh, similar to where I was, where it was kind of like, I'm going to have to retool or retire. You know, like in the startup augmentation industry, as a consultant in some of the major, like what do you call it, Silicon Valley type market, they're seeing more and more opening in data science, big data, data engineering, those kind of role and, and opportunities. Whereas you'd see more on DBA type role, business intelligence, those kind of roles in the past. But like more recently, they have started picking up places like Minnesota and other markets. So uh, that was kind of interesting. So are you seeing a similar thing in, in your market? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the DC where I live is uh, I live in the Washington DC area. So DC is always kind of, I like to say we're, I guess, just like Silicon Valley, we're kind of our own bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, we do have a, a, a pretty sizable uh, startup scene too. But uh, what's interesting is, and, and one of my last jobs at Microsoft would be I would present um, uh, technology solutions to basically policymakers or congressional members of Congress and their staff. And I would show them the latest G Wiz gadget, the latest G Wiz, you know, kind of 3D rendering stuff you could do on Windows. Mm -hmm. What really got their attention, and this is how I got started with data science, mm -hmm. would be I could take raw data and turn it into something actionable. Nice. 
And, you know, there's um, what really got their attention is a number of demos that I, we could pull together. Uh, obviously, using only Microsoft tools because you're mm -hmm. Microsoft. <laughs> Yeah. Um, would be pulling in weather data about hurricanes, right? Which is unfortunately now a very topical uh, topic. Uh, and we have data all from Hurricane Sandy that, you know, we call the Hurricane Sandy demo, where if you can kind of track the demographics of a population, population density from the Census Bureau, uh, then you can also take uh, information from the U.S. Geological Survey about um you know, how different types of soil and areas are, that are flood prone, uh, then you can kind of mash that up with density or population, density of, of elderly folks, uh, where there's a lot of a cluster of people who, who may not be able to travel on their own. Uh, you can also mash that up with uh, local state data with, in terms of who has cars and who had, you know, what, where there are areas where there's not a lot of um, uh, transit available. Uh, and then you can, you can take that data, and this is the, the hypothetical scenario, uh, then you can you can kind of figure out where the wind rain damage is going to be uh, based on forecast. You can kind of uh, get that that forecast path, which we've all seen on the news for mm -hmm. a hurricane, and say if mm -hmm. you're within this range, now you know this is how you should start you know thinking about your evacuation plan. You know, obviously in nursing homes and and things like that. Figure out how to how to get people out, people at risk out of uh, uh, of danger, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the type of thing that really gets their attention. The other thing is with with if you're really good at BI uh, or uh, data visualization, you can turn raw data, which is raw data is everywhere. I mean, that's just we breathe data, we we exhale data, uh, but you know it's it's really useless in and of its own. It has to be refined. So mm -hmm. if you have the ability to turn raw data into a story, this is particularly important for a member of Congress or an elected official. Uh, they can they can infer certain information about that and then create headlines rather than be driven by headlines and uh, it really opens the idea of 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 um our elected officials being more proactive about problems as opposed to being reactive about problems that definitely makes sense thank you for sharing your thoughts on that as a data lead of Wintelect, i remember going to that site and there were some uh, instructional uh, materials about data science what is your goal with that so I have a, I could say, I could say that I'm on a mission, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. There, there's a sea change coming in the technology industry, and we kind of touched upon it in terms of the academic computer science world is being drafted into the commercial world. If you look at all the lead data scientists at uh, the major companies like Facebook or uh, Apple or um, you know even Microsoft, uh, they all have one thing in common. They, they are either part-time or former academics. Um, and I think that's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. That basically Facebook and, you know, I'll, I'll pick on them, but I mean, they, they have a very strong relationship with, uh, I think it's NYU. So they've, they've kind of reached out to academia and academia mm -hmm. is getting involved in uh, the commercial side of business in a way that they never really have before. Uh, you also see that with the SQL crowd, uh, the data crowd where they are basically trying to figure out what their next step in career is. See that certainly in the software engineering uh, uh, space where people are realizing that, you know, the future of programming is going to involve a lot more AI uh, or teaching program uh, computers how to think for themselves. Um, so that sea change is coming. And I think I'm one of the, I'm certainly not the first, but I'm one of the more, um, you know, the um, earlier adopters. Um, uh, and I, I just want to provide people assistance and kind of climbing over the wall from kind of traditional programming into working in data science, uh, and encouraging people because a lot of people think that data science is rocket science. Uh, it mm -hmm. certainly feels that way. Uh, it certainly sounds that way. If you're not familiar with the mathematical terminologies, uh, mm -hmm. that are being used and you, st you just fire up a YouTube video and somebody starts <laughs> talking about, uh, you know, uh, for GANs or, you know, convolutional neural networks and, mm -hmm. and, and some of these square problems, it's just like, what are they talking about? Yeah. Um, well, and it's def go ahead. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Or they could just think high school uh, algebra, say y equals mx plus v, just to get some insight on linear regression, right? <laughs> right, right. And it's funny how very few YouTube videos kind of mention that simple formula. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, people, I guess, on YouTube are looking for the new hotness and they're trying to be 
all cutting edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, y equals uh, mx plus b is 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 the essence of linear regression, and um, that is really kind of the uh, it's 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 the the main formula. And so so my goal in both data driven and and at my 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 work at the uh, the Wintelect now portion of Wintelect where we we do the online courses is to make these concepts relatable and understandable uh, to software engineers. Uh, and that's also our mission at Data Driven. Uh, Andy has a, has a database background, as a data engineer. Uh, I have a background as a software engineer. So we kind of talk about, well, you know, we get guests on to talk about, hey, you know, what is the difference between this and that? We kind of, we want to explain things in terms that people who are curious about data science can understand. You also blog what kind of postings you make uh, out there and, sure. and how, let's say, SQL, Azure, and other open source technologies are utilized in that project? Yeah, so I run my blog, uh, franksworld.com, on WordPress, uh, and it's actually back-ended. Um, well, right now it's back-ended on MySQL on Azure uh, because there was an incident <laughs> with a third-party provider that um, uh, just decided to delete my data and all their backups through a, um, a very humorous bureaucratic mistake. Uh, I can laugh about it now, but I assure mm -hmm. you. So for weeks ago, I was not laughing. Yeah. Um, were they able to recover it? No. Oh, that's a little more. They were not. I know. It was, it was, yeah, I mean, it was tough, but, um, you know, I, I kind of, I've, I've been through worse and I kind of saw this as an opportunity because I, I had this blog. I've had the website since 1995 mm -hmm. and, um, I've had it as a blog, you know, in some form or another since 2002. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had data posts going back to 2004 and, while it always was cool to kind of go back and look at my posts, mm -hmm. if I looked at my posts, at some point, the no one's looking for silver light information anymore. Let's be blunt. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of people are looking for Windows Phone uh, mm -hmm. or Windows 8 development tips anymore, which mm -hmm. is what the co topics were. So yeah. I really saw this as an opportunity to reboot uh, uh, and rebrand. You know, mm -hmm. a bit like the um, you know the J.J. Abrams reboot of Star Trek. You know, okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, I mean, now the site is, is, is you know, largely focused on data science. Um, mm -hmm. I find a lot of great material out there um, and I want to share that with the world and, 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 and find, find videos on YouTube that really explain things in, in really great ways. Um, there's an awesome gentleman by the name of Siraj Raval, mm -hmm. who he is just, he's a born communicator. He's a very smart guy. Mm -hmm. His videos on data science are awesome. Mm -hmm. um, they are anything but boring, and um, like he'll he'll have a video title, you know, you know, create a neural network in TensorFlow in four minutes. Yep, and your first I've thought seen is that. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your first thought is like, you can't do that in four minutes. Yeah, but you watch it. I mean, you better have a seatbelt on because it does go that fast. <laughs> yep, and but you still under he does it in such a way, so talented that like he does it in such a way at the end of four minutes you don't understand 100%, but you understand like 80%. It's yeah. pretty good. I've seen one of his recent video on e utilizing deep learning with a StarCraft API. And, yes. And there, there was some uh, programming codes he demonstrated on how it can do like a uh, shard collection via those worker bots in StarCraft games. Uh, that was kind of yeah. cool. So I was like asking, him, can you use this in WarCraft and other games? And he said, yes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is amazing what I think we're we're really just scratching the surface in terms of what AI is going to do mm -hmm. in entertainment and games and things like that and and the workplace and um, it's really an exciting time to be in this field. Nice. I think I have helped myself with way too many more questions than we had originally planned. And Shabram, do you have any uh, follow up questions to Frank? I don't, but I just want to thank you, uh, Frank, for sharing all the awesome insights. And, you know, I find we find this talk really inspirational. I'm sure people would like to, you know, catch up with you and find out more. So if you don't mind sharing your Twitter or blog connection or social, me social media in general, that would be awesome. Sure. So uh, you can reach me at Tableteer on Twitter, uh, which is a user ID that harkens back to my days uh, doing handwriting recognition systems in Microsoft um, Windows XP Tablet PC Edition. Um, so that was something I used to do a lot with. Um, and you can also find me on uh, Facebook slash um, 
Frank's World TV is uh, is the group that I post to, and also we also have Data Driven. Um, I think Data Driven TV as well on Facebook. Uh, nice. You can always check out Data Driven TV, the website, uh, and uh, I think I mentioned this before, but Frank'sWorld.com is my blog. Nice. Well, we'll be sure to check it out, and we hope everybody uh, goes to it and checks out your cool work. We'll love awesome. to do Thank everything. You so much. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Data Podcast. You're welcome to follow our hosts on Twitter at Rajib2k5, at Shabnam Khan2017, and on YouTube at youtube.com slash Rajib2k5. Our episodes are also available via iTunes, SoundCloud, Google, and other podcasting platforms. Thank you for tuning in.